So today's video is day number three of 10 days of terror. If you are new to my channel, every single day for the next seven days at this point, every single day up until Halloween and on Halloween, I am gonna be uploading a new true crime video. So if that sounds like something you want to be a part of, something that you want to be around here for, make sure you subscribe to my channel, make sure you've got my notifications on so you know when I upload. And today we're gonna to be talking about our first serial killer of the series. And we've got quite a few in this 10 days of terror. So today we're gonna to be talking about the Gainesville Ripper, who was a serial killer back in the 80s and 90s. And this case actually inspired the Scream movies. If you've never seen them, this is the the famous mask thing from it. The famous mask thing. I know some people are <laughs> not gonna like me for saying that. But yeah, before I get into this video, I just wanna give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This is all just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. So in August of 1990, students at the University of Florida were moving into their dorm rooms and getting everything ready for the next year of college. On August 23rd, two roommates, 17 year old Christina Powell and 18 year old Sonia Larson both went to Walmart, picked up some last minute bits to decorate their dorm with, some stationery, and then they went home that night and suddenly went very quiet. They stopped answering their phones, they weren't seen on campus for a few days, in fact they hadn't even been seen leaving their dorm. Christina's parents planned on visiting her at her new dorm a couple of days before class started on Sunday the 26th. However, she wasn't answering any of their calls. Her parents were obviously a little bit concerned that she wasn't answering her phone. However, they just put it down to the fact that she was moving into a new place, getting everything ready for classes to begin. Maybe there was a problem with the phone lines over there. She'd moved away from home to a complete different place. So maybe her phone service wasn't so good over there. And so the Powells thought that even though they weren't hearing from the daughter, she wasn't answering her phone, they were still going to go and visit her. So on the Sunday morning, Christina Powell's parents got to her dorm that she shared with Sonia Larson. They knocked on the door, but the girls weren't answering at all. There were no lights on in the apartment, there was no noise coming from inside the apartment, and they weren't answering the door, so it was as if they'd gone out for the day but Christina Powell's car was still in the car park. So Christina's parents panicked, they called police who came and knocked the door down to the apartment and there they found both girls dead. The first body was that of Sonia Larson, lying on her bed on the top floor. It's believed she was asleep when the attack began. She'd been stabbed 20 times and a sticky residue on her mouth suggested that her mouth had probably been taped. She had cuts all over her hands and arms showing that she really tried to defend herself during this attack. She really tried to fight her attacker off, but it didn't work. Once Sonia was dead, her killer had dragged her body to the bottom of the bed. They could tell this because her arms were above her head as if she'd been dragged by her legs. The killer then positioned Sonia's body in a sexually degrading way and then went downstairs to kill Christina, who was asleep on the couch at the beginning of the attack. The killer spent a significantly longer time with Christina, taping her mouth and her wrists this time so she couldn't try to fight him back. Christina was violently raped before her killer flipped her over and stabbed her five times in the back. He positioned Christina's body in the same sexually degrading position that he'd positioned Sonia's body in and this time he actually mutilated the body, cutting off Christina's nipples and taking them with him. Before leaving the girl's apartment, the killer went into the kitchen and ate one of their bananas and then left the skin on the side almost as a taunt for police. So quickly police were noticing a lot of different things about this crime scene. First of all, there was a towel and a bottle of washing up liquid by Christina's body. Her body had been washed to presumably get rid of any evidence of rape. They then realised that Christina's clothes didn't seem to have been taken off normally or even ripped from her body. They were cut off of her body with a knife and police concluded that by the way that the clothes were cut by the killer that Christina was already bound at this point. So the initially believed motive by police was that maybe this was a burglary gone wrong. However, nothing was stolen and one of the girls was raped, so that didn't seem like a burglary gone wrong. Another motive that police came up with was that maybe it was one of the girl's ex-partners. Maybe they were jealous, maybe they wanted to get revenge for a breakup or something. But after police spoke to both girls' parents, both girls' groups of friends and things, no one could think of any ex-partners or men in the girls' lives that would want to do this to them. They hadn't left anything on bad terms. Due to the severity and the callousness of these murders, mutilating the bodies, positioning the bodies, police believed that this was possibly 
just someone killing for the sake of killing. They seem to enjoy murdering people. And these are very common characteristics of serial killers. Mutilating body parts, taking parts away as trophies, positioning the bodies so that they can be found in the most shocking way possible by police. This wasn't a usual one-off homicide scene. A lot of people that do one-off homicides don't mutilate the body, they don't tie up their victims, they don't position their victims and so police worried that maybe this was the first of many. Then just eight hours after the bodies of Christina and Sonia were found, it seemed that another girl had gone missing. 18 year old Krista Hoyt was a student at Santa Fe College and she worked as a records clerk at the local police station. She was expected in for work at midnight on Monday the 27th but she didn't show up and she'd never done this before. She never just didn't come into work without warning one of her co-workers that she wasn't gonna be in. And because of this, because it was so out of character for Krista, but also mixed with the fact that they just found two bodies of teenage girls the same age as Krista, her co-workers panicked. Because of this, they went to check on Krista at her ground floor apartment, hoping that maybe she'd just forgotten that she was in work or maybe she was ill or something. And so they went and knocked on her door but they got no answer. Officers then walked around the side of the building and noticed one piece of fence that was kind of bent over as if someone had just trampled over it. They then noticed that Christina's sliding glass doors seemed to be open a little bit and it seemed as though the lock had been tampered with. These doors actually had Venetian blinds covering them which are blinds that come down from the ceiling like that and one side of them was actually raised a little bit and so an officer got down onto his hands and knees to look inside and there he saw Krista Hoyt's body on the bed. Her body was naked, she was slumped in a sitting position at the end of the bed and she was decapitated. But her head wasn't just on the bed next to her or on the floor or anything, it was actually on a bookcase facing her body. Her killer had placed it so she was looking at herself. Christina's cause of death however was a single stab wound to the back clearly done by the same weapon that had killed Sonia and Christina and so police quickly linked all three of these killings and branded this man a serial killer. Once again the killer had cut off Krista's nipples and this time they were on the bed next to her which was another connection between the murders. Krista had also been bound, raped and her clothes cut from her with a knife just like Christina Powell. Pathologists found that Krista had been dead for around two days before the police found her, so possibly on the same day or the next day as Sonia and Christina's murders. But she hadn't always been in that sitting position that police found her in. She was actually laid on her back for a significant amount of time after her murder, and they could tell this from discoloration on her back from the blood pooling. It's believed that Krista's murderer stayed in her apartment with her dead body for hours after killing her. Also, due to when most of the blood had drained from Krista's body, most of it had drained from that wound on her back, meaning that her decapitation happened hours after her death. So this person had killed Krista, left her laid on the bed, hung about in her apartment for a while, then cut off her nipples, cut off her head, put her head on a bookshelf, and then left. So that day on Monday the 27th, news broke that there was a serial killer in Gainesville who was targeting young women in college accommodation. But the public barely even had chance to panic before the killer acted again. The next morning, two more students were reported missing. Both 23 years old were Tracy Paulis and Manny Taborda. The two of them had been really close since high school. Manny was a footballer, Tracy was a cheerleader, and when they found out that they were going to the same college, they decided to be roommates. So Manny's friends realised that they hadn't heard from him in a while, and so they decided to go to campus managers and ask if they could let them into the room. So Manny's friends and the campus manager all went to Manny and Tracy's apartment, and they opened the door, but they didn't get any further. As soon as they opened it, they saw blood and a black bag on the floor. So the friends and the campus manager ran out of the building to call police, thinking that something really bad might have happened. When police got there, however, they opened the door and realised that the black bag that the friends and manager had seen was gone. So police theorised that maybe the killer was still in the apartment when the friends and the manager went to go check on them. And when he heard the door open, he panicked, he grabbed his stuff and escaped through a window or something. Inside, they found Tracy's body lying in the hallway, although there was evidence that she was killed in her bedroom on her bed and was dragged out into the hallway. Again, she had tape marks on her wrists and over her mouth. She'd been raped and her cause of death was three stab wounds to the back. Again, there were so many similarities between Tracy's murder and the murders of the other women. 
For a start, the same murder weapon was used once again. The wounds matched up completely. Once again, Tracy was naked. Her clothes had been cut from her using a knife. However, her bra had been forcibly torn from her. Her body was posed in a sexually degrading way once again. However, she hadn't been mutilated post-mortem. But like I said, police believe that the killer was still in the apartment and fled as soon as he got interrupted. So maybe he was planning on mutilating Tracy's body, but just didn't have time. Manny Taboda was also attacked in his sleep. The killer stabbing him several times all over his body, his face, head, neck, even arms and legs all over his torso. He had slashes and cuts all over his arms and his hands from when he'd woken up and tried to fight his attacker off him. Evidence from the scene suggested that Manny was killed before Tracy. Obviously the killer knew what he was doing. Manny was six foot, 200 plus pounds. He was athletic. He could have easily overpowered another man. Maybe the killer knew that Manny lived with Tracy and so he intentionally attacked Manny first while he was sleeping so that he'd be an easy target to get out of the way. However, maybe the killer didn't know that Manny was going to be there. Maybe it was just lucky for the killer that he stumbled into Manny's room first. Because up until now, this killer seemed to have a very specific victim type. All of them were young women, they were short, they were petite, they had brown hair, brown eyes. Manny was completely different. And Manny's murder upped the fear in the public because up until now, this person had been attacking a particular victim type. So say if you were a taller woman with blonde hair, you felt a little bit safer because he seemed to be going for short, petite, brown haired women. However, now after this person had killed a man, it seemed he was just killing anyone he crossed. Then suddenly, after finding five bodies in three days, the killing seemed to stop, although police were expecting a lot more. So now police could properly put some time into finding this killer because up until now, they'd just been finding bodies after bodies and they hadn't had chance to properly search for this person doing it. So police quickly established a lot of links between the victims. Like I said, all apart from one had been petite Caucasian women with brown hair, brown eyes. All the women's apartments had sliding glass doors that the killer had broken into using a knife and a screwdriver. And these sliding glass doors also all looked out onto a kind of wooded area, a garden area, somewhere that in the dark, this person could spy on their potential victims. And it was quickly theorised that this is exactly what the Gainesville Ripper did. He would watch his victims, stalk his victims before he attacked. He was a very thorough planner. So let me just run back through all the very obvious connections between the murders. Same murder weapon, there was always sexual assault involved, same method of killing, stab wounds. All the women had also been bound with duct tape at the wrist, some over the mouth as well. And the killer had always removed this duct tape very carefully after the women were dead and taken it away with him just in case it had any kind of evidence on it that could trace back to him. The killer also positioned all of his victims in a very sexually degrading way. He also post-mortem mutilated the second and the third bodies, cutting off the women's nipples. All the women's clothes were cut from their bodies using a knife rather than ripped off. However, their bras were always ripped off forcibly pulled from their bodies. Prints on Tracy's leg and a towel at the first murder scene suggested that the killer actually used gloves while carrying out these attacks. Police searched local rivers, lakes, wooded areas, local bins to see if this killer had binned any kind of evidence like weapons, duct tape, gloves, anything but they didn't find a single piece of evidence. Meanwhile, the people of Gainesville were in full panic mode. All the shops in Gainesville and the surrounding cities sold out completely of guns, mace, bats, other kind of protective items. Students were pulling out of their courses at that college and enrolling elsewhere. People were staying in hotels rather than their own homes because they felt safer. Car parks were full of police cars where police were out searching for different evidence in woods and in lakes, like I said. Local colleges hired round-the-clock security guards to stand outside sorority houses, outside dorm buildings. Meanwhile, the people of Gainesville were talking and theorising and rumours quickly began to spread. Some people thought that the killer was a pizza delivery man and when he came to deliver your pizza, he would kill you. Some people said 
he was dressed as a doctor, some people said he was dressed as a policeman, which at the time was a really damaging rumour because then people started to lose trust in the police. So police discussed potential motives for this serial killer. Were they burglaries gone wrong? Were they burglaries where violence turned this man sexual? But ultimately they decided that the motives for these murders was that he was attracted to petite brunette women and he was a power hungry person that was sexually motivated in these attacks. Police also questioned a few things about how this serial killer operated. Like why did he wait until after he'd killed the women to mutilate them? Why would he stab some victims up to 30 times and other victims just once? It was strange because even though the method of killing was very consistent, there were always slight differences between them, like leaving one of the women on the floor and the other women in their beds. The decapitation at the third murder and leaving her sat up. He cut off two of the women's nipples one of them he took away with him and one of them he left at the scene. There were all sorts of kind of little differences that police couldn't understand why. Police then created a suspect profile, which if you don't know what that is, it's basically a likely description of who the killer could be, like what type of person. It's calculated by looking at the sequence of events that the killer chose, what kind of weapon the killer chose, how the killer chose to use that weapon, how they left the crime scene, how they broke into the houses, things like that. It all just kind of paints a picture of what kind of person this is. So the suspect profile that police came up with was a white male in his late 20s to early 30s, probably around six foot with a strong athletic build. He was probably single, he was probably a loner, he might have average to above average intelligence, very organised with a good knowledge of police work and he knew what police were looking for, so maybe some previous experience in the police force. They believed that this man probably had a criminal past of some sort, probably for assault or sexual assault, some form of like violent crime. They believed he was very confident, had a good self-image, a very poor image of women, he didn't really value women, he was probably not religious and he might have some sort of military experience. He probably had a neat clean appearance and worked in a menial job that required little skill. Although suspect profiles aren't 100% accurate, these are just theories to give police an idea of what they're probably looking for in a suspect. They're not used to only question men that fit that profile, you know what I mean? Meanwhile, results from forensic tests were finally coming back. With this being the early 1990s, these tests took quite a few days to complete. DNA found on Christina Powell's underwear, along with a paper towel that was found by her body, both tested positive for semen, along with a sample taken from Krista Hoyt's body. And these samples were all from the same person, confirming what police already thought that all of these murders were linked and they had a serial killer. Now all they had to do was identify this semen sample. Police created a suspect list of 675 men in the Gainesville area. Some of them had criminal pasts, some of them had been tip-offs from the public, but all of them were suspicious for some reason or another. So now police had to go about interviewing and obtaining DNA from each of these 675 men. But police were suspicious of one man in particular. 18 year old Edward Humphrey's name had been handed over to police several times from several different people and for good reason. Edward used to live in the same apartment complex as Tracy Paulis and Manny Taboda and some sources that I read said that he had a little bit of a crush on Tracy. The reason he no longer lived there however was because he was kicked out for erratic and threatening behaviour against other tenants. Edward always carried a knife, he insisted on wearing like full camo combat gear just on the day to day and he was just kind of known as a bit of a loner, a bit of a weirdo around that kind of area. And around the same time of the murders, women at the local bank actually had a really disturbing run-in with Edward Humphrey. I have no idea how they got onto the topic of this conversation, how this was brought up, but Edward Humphrey said to the girl serving him at the bank, that he had knives at home that could rip the skin from her body. Then on August 30th, so just three days after the last murder, Edward Humphreys was arrested and charged with aggravated assault against his own grandmother. He was immediately taken to a mental health facility to be assessed and monitored and there he was actually diagnosed with bipolar disorder or manic depression as it was known back then. So if all of those previous experiences of his tenants having to get him kicked out of that apartment complex weren't enough, now police had proof 
that he was a violent individual from his assault on his grandmother. So while Edward was in the mental facility, police decided to sit him down and question him at length about these killings. And Edward worryingly seemed to have a lot of extensive knowledge about how the bodies were mutilated, how the crime scenes were cleaned up and how they were left. Edward's bail was set for a million dollars, which is insanely high for an aggravated assault case. And so the public in Gainesville believed that police had caught the killer. Meanwhile, police went and searched Edward Humphrey's apartment and it was bizarre. It was like two different people lived in two different parts of this home. One half of the apartment was normal, it was neat, clean, presentable and the other half was completely trashed, things were broken, there was rubbish on the floor, it was dark. But even though the apartment was weirdly presented, police didn't find any evidence there to link Edward Humphrey to the five murders. Although they did find quite a big collection of knives and screwdrivers, which if you remember, those are the tools that the killer used to break into each of the women's apartments. So all of these knives and screwdrivers were seized and tested, yet none of them matched the murder weapons or the breaking weapons. So Humphrey's saliva, blood and hair samples were all sent for DNA testing against the DNA that they'd recovered from the scene. And if this was a match, then police had found the Gainesville Ripper. Although, like I said, in the early 1990s, technology really wasn't very good with that kind of thing. And it was going to take police weeks to get results back on those tests. However, while Edward Humphrey was in custody for the assault against his grandmother, the murders stopped completely. On October 10th, while still waiting for the results of the DNA test to come back, Edward Humphrey was sentenced to 22 months in a psychiatric facility for that assault against his grandmother. Finally, at the end of October, two weeks after they'd taken the samples, the test results came back and they were negative. Edward Humphrey was not the Gainesville Ripper. So now police were back to square one with completely no suspects and a serial killer still at large. And so they turned to the FBI for help. So the FBI have this program named the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program or VICAP for short. And this is a database that stores all the details of every violent crime ever committed in the US. And officers can basically use this program to compare different crimes. You input key details, so for this one it would be like mutilation, breaking and entering, murder weapon was a knife, the kind of victim description of the petite brunette women and the system will pull up any very similar crimes across the whole of the United States so that police can see if any of them are linked. And the system brought up eight similar cases and one of these eight was actually almost identical to the Gainesville Ripper killings. It was an unsolved triple homicide from Shreveport in Louisiana. On November 4th, 1989, so less than a year before the first killings, 24-year-old Julie Grissom, her father, 55-year-old William Grissom, and her eight-year-old nephew, Sean, were all preparing for dinner at home. And that was when someone broke in and attacked them, stabbing them all to death with the same weapon that the Gainesville Ripper used. So it was clear that Julie Grissom was the killer's main target. She was 24 years old, a college student, brunette, petite, whereas her father and her nephew just seemed to be killed just because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, just like Manny. William and Sean had been stabbed to death in the living room, whereas Julie had been taken upstairs to her bedroom and killed there and there were a lot of similarities between Julie's murder and the Gainesville Ripper victims. She was naked. Again, she'd been bound with tape and the tape had been taken away from the scene by the killer. She'd been posed at the edge of the bed, even to the point where the killer had spread her hair out around her head. He'd really taken so much time with Julie's body. Her cause of death was also three stab wounds to the back, which was exactly how the Gainesville Ripper did it. Once again, the killer had raped Julie and washed down her body to get rid of any evidence. He'd put her clothes in the washing machine as well. She'd also, on top of being stabbed, been bitten several times and also slashed several times. So police quickly connected the two cases, that triple homicide in Louisiana and the five murders back in Gainesville making the serial killer's death toll now eight. So police went back to that old suspect list of 675 people, apart from Edward Humphrey now, so 674, and they checked if any of them had been in Louisiana at the time of those three murders. So as Gainesville police were going through this suspect list of all these people, ruling some people out, questioning some people again, 
They got a call from a different police department in Florida. These other Florida police said that they'd just arrested a man for armed robbery not far away from Gainesville and he was actually originally from Shreveport in Louisiana. So Gainesville police did a little background check on this man and they found that he was actually wanted back in Shreveport in Louisiana for the attempted murder of his own father. This man was 37 year old Danny Rowling, a man with a lengthy criminal past that almost exactly matches the suspect profile of the Gainesville Ripper. Danny Rowling's father had been horrifically abusive to him all his life and he still lived with his parents at age 37, so that's 37 years of horrific abuse. When Danny was just five years old, the family adopted a puppy and his father beat this puppy to death in front of Danny and it died in his arms when he was just five years old. His father also abused Danny's mother to the point where she had a nervous breakdown. He abused Danny all the way through his adulthood as well as his childhood and Danny actually attempted suicide many times throughout his life because of this. So as you can imagine Danny Rowling really did not like his father and at this point he'd been living with him and enduring this abuse for almost 40 years. So one day the two of them had an argument, it turned physical and Danny just pulled out a gun and shot at his father trying to kill him. He shot his father once in the head and once in the chest and he believed he'd killed him and so Danny went on the run. However, his father survived. So obviously with this level of violence, police believed that they were onto a solid suspect and so they began looking into Danny's criminal history. And Danny Rowling had a lengthy criminal history. Ever since he was just a preteen, he was killing animals, he was looking into girls' windows. And this eventually led into more serious crimes like theft, armed robbery, assaults, sexual assaults. Police quickly found that Danny had served time in three different states for armed robbery and so they decided to look into kind of unsolved armed robberies in the Gainesville area at the time of the murders and they found exactly that an unsolved armed robbery of a bank in Gainesville on the same morning that Krista Hoyt's body was found. The suspects were a black male and a white male both of which were actually spotted near a wooded area just hours after the armed robbery. So police went to confront these men and the white male ran straight into the woods whereas the black male stayed there with police and just kind of gave himself up. He said that his accomplice's name, the white male that had run off into the woods, was called Michael or Mike Kennedy. And so police chased him off into the woods, but they actually lost him. However, they found a makeshift campsite where they believed that he was staying. They found a tent, camping equipment, clothes, bags, a bag full of money covered in red dye, which was obviously from the bank. So all the items were taken from this campsite and put into evidence lockers about the armed robbery, but nothing more was ever really done with them. They were never searched properly or anything. But now police decided to go back to all of this evidence thinking that maybe Michael Kennedy could have been Danny Rowling. At the campsite, they found a ski mask, which when tested matched fibers found on a tiny little piece of tape found at the third murder scene. On a pair of pants found in one of the bags, there was a tiny little splash of blood which matched Manny Taboda. A screwdriver found at the campsite matched to the markings on the sliding doors where the killer had broken into the apartments. One of Krista Hoyt's pubic hairs was found in the sleeping bag. The physical connections to these murder scenes just went on and on. But then police remembered that they'd actually recovered a tape and headphones from the campsite, but they'd never actually listened to what was on the tape until now. It was a voice recording from Danny Rowling himself addressed to his mother and his brother. I know I'll have to run the rest of my life, but I'm getting pretty good at it. So I don't want you feeling sorry for me. I don't want you worrying about me. I'm a big boy. I take care of myself. We're all down here for just a breath anyway. Well, I'm going to sign off for a little bit. I've got something i got to do. Police believed that these recordings were made before the first Gainesville murder even happened. Meanwhile, Danny Rowling was actually still being held in jail for that armed robbery that police caught him for in the first place. So police decided to pay him a visit, but he wouldn't say much of anything, he wouldn't admit to anything, he was just being very kind of uncooperative, as you would imagine. He did, however, let police take fingerprints, a blood sample, and a tooth that he'd recently had taken out. And then police told him, in a room with about five other people in, that they were going to need between 30 and 50 pubic hairs to be able to test. Danny Rowling then replied, no problem. He stood up, exposed himself, 
and ripped out two full handfuls of pubic hair from his body. He then slammed these two handfuls of hair onto the table and said that ought to be 50. After a couple of weeks, the DNA results came back and it was a match to all three crime scenes. Danny Rowling was the Gainesville Ripper. He was charged with five counts of first degree murder, three counts of sexual battery and three counts of armed burglary. But since DNA was a relatively new science at the time, it still wasn't completely admissible in court because they couldn't trust that this science was legit at this point. And so police knew that they couldn't rely on this DNA evidence. They needed a confession, really. While Danny Rowling was in jail for his armed robbery, he became friends with his cellmate, Bobby Lewis. And Bobby Lewis was actually a pretty infamous criminal. He was, at the time, the only person to have ever escaped off of death row. So Danny befriended Bobby thinking that with the volume and the severity of his own crimes, he was probably gonna get put on death row. And so maybe Bobby had some advice on how he could get out of it. He told Bobby Lewis all about his murders in detail and he told him that he wanted to be a superstar, just like Ted Bundy. Then a month before his trial date, Danny Rowling asked to speak to Gainesville police. He was ready to confess. But on one condition, he did not want to speak to police directly. He would only do that if he absolutely had to. But other than that, if it wasn't required by law that Danny had to say these things directly to the police, he wanted to speak through his cellmate Bobby Lewis. So he would whisper his answer to Bobby and Bobby would tell the police. And this questioning took hours, but Danny Rowling finally confessed every single detail of how he committed these murders. He said that he travelled everywhere to and from these murder scenes by bike because it was quite quick, but at the same time it didn't have the noise and the light that a car had. So the first murders he admitted to were the first bodies that police found, Sonia Larson and Christina Powell. So like I said right at the beginning of this video, the two girls were in Walmart on the last day that they were seen. They were just picking up some last bits and pieces for their next year at college and Danny Rowling also happened to be in that Walmart at the same time as the girls. He saw them, he thought that they were pretty, they were both petite brunette and he stalked the girls all the way back to their apartment where he could formulate an entry plan for his attack later on that night. He said he initially broke into the house on the ground floor through the sliding doors and he saw Christina Powell asleep on the sofa. He said he watched her sleeping for a while and then decided he would kill Sonia first and then come back and kill Christina. As for Krista Hoyt and Tracy Paulis, again he targeted and stalked those women specifically and said that he had to kill Manny to get him out of the way. But as for the Grissom family murders, Danny refused to talk about them, admit to them anything and said that he'd clear them up in due time. So then police asked Danny Rowling why he'd committed these murders. They wanted a motive. And Danny said that he wanted to kill one person for every year that he had spent in prison for his armed robberies and stuff. Danny Rowling had spent a total of eight years in prison over the course of his life. And so he said he wanted to take another person's life for every year of his life that had been taken from him. And he did kill eight people successfully. He killed those five in Gainesville and those three in Louisiana. Although many people don't believe this, many people believe that Danny Rowling would have gone on to kill so many more had he not been caught. People think that Danny just wanted the power and the control in this situation. He didn't want police to take credit for stopping him. He wanted to say that he stopped himself, which is very likely because everything was about power with Danny Rowling. All of his victims were posed in sexually degrading positions. He tried to humiliate the bodies. It was all about power for him. So Danny's defense was all ready for him to plead not guilty by reason of insanity when his trial began in April of 1994. However, Danny had other plans. In one last attempt to take control of his situation, Danny stood up right at the beginning of his trial and pled guilty to all five murders. He didn't say anything to his defence team beforehand, he didn't even say anything to Bobby Lewis, he didn't say anything to anyone. He wanted this to be his last attempt at shocking other people and taking the power back. And with that, Danny Rowling was sentenced to death on April 20th, 1994. However, he wasn't actually executed until 12 years later on October 25th, 2006. His last meal consisted of lobster, shrimp, baked potato, cheesecake and sweet tea. Then Rowling was taken to the execution room where many of his victims' families could watch him die through a massive glass window on the side of the room. He didn't give any last words, he just mumbled a gospel hymn to himself and then he laid in the chair and as he was being injected with the lethal injection, he stared every single one of his victims' family members 
in the eye as he was dying. The Gainesville Ripper, Danny Harold Rowlin, was pronounced dead at 6.31pm on October 25th, 2006. After his death, police found a note that he'd left in his cell which actually admitted to him killing the Grissom family. Around the same time after his execution, a woman came forward to say that she believed that she was a Gainesville Ripper survivor. Just two weeks before the first Gainesville Ripper killing, Janet Frake was attacked in her own home by who she believes to be Danny Rowling. He broke into her house and tried to handcuff her hands behind her back, but when the handcuffs wouldn't lock into place properly, he just taped her hands and taped over her eyes. He ripped the clothes from Janet's body, raped her in her bedroom, and then took her to the bathroom and raped her again there. He then told Janet that he would continue to rape her all night and then kill her and leave her body in the closet. But Janet was very calm, she was very smart in this situation. She realised that this man was probably attacking her for some kind of reason, he was probably lashing out, he probably had some sort of mental illness, and so she began talking to him. She was just talking to him how a friend would talk. They were just talking about his life, his problems, like what he enjoyed doing, something that she felt he probably didn't have and that was why he was lashing out. He even said to me at one point, in any other circumstance, you would literally like to date me. And that made me sick, but I just kept going on with the whole night thinking, I've got to get this man out of my house. Janet Frake was actually very into true crime herself. She watched a lot of TV shows, read a lot of books, and so she knew exactly what to do to leave evidence of this man in her home in case he did kill her so that police could find him. She hid a towel in her bedroom with his semen on for police to find which had DNA evidence on it and she also prepared Danny a glass of beer hoping that he would obviously pick it up and leave fingerprints on the glass. But of course she survived, she never needed any of those. I don't know why she didn't take the towel with the seminal fluid to the police anyway because then they could find who'd done all of this to her he'd raped her twice at this point but a lot of people in that situation do just kind of want to forget about it they don't want to go through court cases and everything so that's totally understandable but yeah that completes this case that was the Gainesville Ripper thank you so much for watching this whole video if you enjoyed make sure you leave a big thumbs up and subscribe down below because like I said I'm doing 10 days of terror on my channel right now a new true crime video every single day and there is a fair few serial killer videos in that 10 days so I know you guys like those ones. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye.